Welcome to Learn This Game, where you can learn about board games and how they are played. Today, we'll be looking at U-Boat Leader, 2nd Edition. In this video, there will be a general description and overview of the game. We'll inventory the components, and we'll go through gameplay, including setup, sample turns, and victory conditions. In this video, we'll be using the 2nd Edition game rules. In the description, there'll be some helpful links. There'll also be a timestamp index so you can navigate directly to any part of the presentation. If you want to skip this introduction and go straight to the game setup and gameplay, you can go to the timestamp index now. And if you find this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also leave a comment to share your experience or let us know what game you would like to see reviewed. U Boat Leader was first published by DVG in 2011, and the second edition was published in 2016. It was designed by David Schuler. In this solitaire war game, you'll be leading German submarines on missions in the Atlantic during World War II. This game is recommended for ages 12 and older. It is low to moderate difficulty, and each campaign takes about 90 minutes to play. This game is designed for solitaire play only. There are no official multiplayer variants. An app is not required, and there are no apps available for this game. There are no expansions, but you can purchase ship miniatures that can be used for U-Boat Leader and the companion game Gato Leader. This game is part of a line of games by DVG known as the Leader Series, which covers various historical periods and modes of warfare. The publisher link will be in the description so you can see the full line on the publisher's website. Now that you've seen a brief introduction to the game, let's get into the game itself. This is a solitaire card-driven game using a map, cards, counters, and a 10-sided die. Thematically, this game is set in the Atlantic during World War II, where the player controls German submarines fighting the Allied forces and merchant ships. Now let's see how the game is won. Each game consists of a campaign as represented by a campaign sheet. In each campaign, you will select the short, medium, or long option and each designated duration lists how well you do depending on the victory points you achieve throughout the game. Now let's look at the components. There is one 32-page color rulebook. There is one campaign log to track your U-boat's progress throughout the game. This is meant to be copied and used. You can also download a version from the publisher at dvg.com. The link will be in the description. There is one blue 10-sided die. There are 352 color counters representing U-boats, merchant ships, naval vessels, and various administrative counters. There is one mounted help sheet to place three decks. The bottom of the sheet can be referenced throughout the game to assist with gameplay. There is one mounted tactical display where battles take place using counters. There are four campaign sheets representing different periods during World War II. One campaign sheet is used per game, but all of them can be linked to form one long campaign. So any experience points and promotions in one campaign would be carried over to the next. There are 165 cards. These include cards depicting individual German U-boats and the various decks used during the game. Now let's set up the game for play. First, we'll select a campaign. The campaign sheet will provide the information needed to set up the game. For this playthrough, we'll select the Happy Time campaign sheet covering June 1940 to May 1941. This campaign covers the period when U-boats and wolf packs dominated the seas. Each campaign sheet has a map of the area where the U-boats will travel. We will review the map in more detail during gameplay. Each campaign has three time frames, short, medium, and long. We will select the medium period which requires two patrols and gives us 41 special option points to spend on U-boats and special options. The patrol number shows the number of patrols each U-boat must make during the campaign. A patrol consists of a U-boat leaving a port box, moving through the map areas, interacting with convoy cards, and then returning to a port box over the course of several strategic segments. This particular campaign has two port boxes. If there is more than one port box on the map, a U-boat does not have to return to the same port box where it started. U-boats can leave port and return to port during different strategic segments, and do not have to leave and return at the same time. We will see how a patrol is conducted during gameplay. This campaign sheet designates 41 SOs, or special option points. These points are spent purchasing U-boats and special options for a campaign. The VP table shows how many victory points are needed to achieve the different levels of success. The lower left area shows the turn sequence, which you can reference throughout the game. There are a total of four segments per game turn. 
The turn sequence is also found on the back page of the rulebook. The bottom of the campaign sheet has three sections. The first is the special option notes. The first section lists the special options that can be purchased during a campaign. The cost and special option points is listed on the left, and the number of times the option can be purchased during the campaign is listed on the right. U stands for unlimited. The middle section shows the die roll needed for a U-boat to join a wolf pack. The right section shows the special instructions for the game. For this campaign, we'll have to remove certain cards from the convoy deck. Also, we see that Type 2 U-boats can only operate in certain areas of the map. Next, we'll place the mounted help sheet in the play area. We'll shuffle the merchant cards and place them face down in the designated area. Then we'll shuffle the escort cards and place them face down on the next designated area. Then we'll set the three fleet escort cards to the side. These cards are only used when a naval convoy is encountered. Then we'll shuffle the naval cards and place them in the last space on the help sheet. Next, we place the mounted tactical display in the play area. This board is used to resolve battles between allied convoys and the U-boats. We shuffle the event cards and place them face down in the designated area. Recall the campaign sheet instructed us to remove convoy cards 32, 33, and 34. We take these cards and remove them completely from the game. After removing the three convoy cards, we shuffle the remaining convoy cards and place them on the tactical display. We then place the 10-sided die nearby. We then take all of the hit counters and place them in an opaque container. If you are playing a campaign that starts in June 1942 or later, you would place the tactics counters in another draw container to be used when escorts are detecting and attacking U-boats. We will not need these since we are playing an earlier campaign. We will now use our special option points to purchase our U-boats. Let's see how to read a U-boat card. In the upper left are several types of information. The first is the U-boat name. Each U-boat has a corresponding counter placed on the map and tactical display. Next is a captain's name for historical flavor and does not have an effect on the game. The type is also listed. Certain types of U-boats cannot enter certain areas during the game. There is also the time period that shows when the U-boat could be employed. SO shows the cost of this U-boat and special option points. This area shows the special ability of this U-boat. This area shows the experience level of the crew. Each U-boat has two double-sided cards that show four different experience levels. The number next to the level shows how many experience points are needed to be promoted to the next level. The hull hit points are also shown here. When the number of hull hits is equal to the hull rating, the U-boat is considered sunk. The stress table shows how stress affects the status, initiative, gunnery skill, torpedo skill, and evasion ability of the U-boat. The bottom area shows how many ready and stored torpedoes can be held. Torpedoes are represented by counters that will be placed under the card in these areas. In the lower left corner is the card number used for inventory purposes. We will spend option points to purchase the following U-boats. 9 points on Ace Level U-23, 16 points on Veteran U-122, 7 points on Trained U-47, and 8 points on Trained U-96. We spend a total of 40 option points out of 41, so we can save 1 point for special operations during the game. Next, we place the torpedo counters under each U-boat card in the appropriate ready and stored torpedo areas. Then we place the ammo counters to track our gun attacks. U-boats capable of gun attacks start with 6 ammo counters. Type 2 and Type 21 U-boats do not have gun decks, so do not receive ammo counters. Now that we have selected our U-boats, we can take the corresponding counters and place them on the campaign map. We can place the U-boat counters on the submerged or surface sides on any port box on the map. We will place U-boat 23 and U-boat 96 on the Port Germany box. We will place U-boats 47 and 122 on the Port France box. Next, we'll fill out the campaign log. Each U-boat has its own section so we can record their experience and victory points for each patrol. At the end of the campaign, we can total the victory points to see how we did. When you are done setting up the game, your game area should contain the following. The campaign map with U-boat counters. The tactical display with the event and convoy decks. The help sheet with the merchant, escort, and naval decks. The campaign log. The U-boats with the torpedo and ammo counters. One ten-sided die. An opaque container with the hit counters the fleet escort cards, and a place for the remaining counters. Now that the game is set up, let's play the example turn as presented in the rulebook.
Each game turn consists of four segments, including strategic, operations, tactical, and refit. Recall that we have elected to play the medium length of the Happy Time campaign. Let's take a closer look at the actual map area of the campaign sheet. Each campaign map is divided into named areas. A U-boat will always be in a named area and will move between named areas when conducting movement. Each area will have a name and several items of information we will be reviewing as we go through the game turn. This campaign map also has two ports. During setup, we place our starter U-boats at the ports. We are now ready to start the first turn. First, we'll play through the strategic segment. During this segment, we decide not to spend any option points or assign special missions. We then move to the operations segment. In this segment, we move U-boats, resolve event cards, and resolve any special missions. During this operation segment, we want to get our U-boats into the British Isles and Southwest Approaches map areas. Starting in the Germany port, we move U-96 into the North Sea. Reading the information in the North Sea area, we see that we must draw two event cards when moving into this area. We draw the Ultra Intercept event card and the Rough Seas event card. The Ultra Intercept card instructs us to place a U-boat warning counter in this map area. The Rough Seas card requires us to add one stress to the U-boat. We do this by adding one stress counter. When the accumulated stress exceeds the stress range on the U-boat card, the crew is considered unfit which will affect their ability to perform future actions. After adding one stress, we then discard both event cards. We then move U-96 to the British Isles, requiring us to draw one event card. We draw the Fatal Error card. Since this U-boat is not unfit, we add two stress to the U-boat for a total of three, since we already had one stress. We then discard the event card. U-boat 23 departs the German port and follows into the North Sea, and draws two event cards. We draw the Enemy Aircraft and Counterintelligence cards. The Enemy Aircraft card requires us to roll the 10-sided die and add the Evasion rating for this U-boat, which is found on the final column of the U-boat card. This U-boat currently has zero stress, so our evasion number is four. We roll a six and add four for the evasion, giving us a total of 10. Per the event card, we add one stress to the U-boat, but we also gain one experience point. We record the experience point gained on the campaign log. Experience points will be needed to promote U-boats to the next experience level. Per the counterintelligence event card, we do not have any air search or supply ship counters to remove, so we discard this with the enemy aircraft card. U-Boat 23 then moves to the British Isles and draws one event card. We draw the clear weather card which has no effect, so we can discard it. From France, U-47 moves into the Southwest Approaches area, which requires us to draw two event cards. We draw Rough Seas and Radio Intercept. We must add one stress to U-47, and we will set the Radio Intercept card aside next to the U-47 card until it is ready to be used. Finally, U-Boat 122 moves into the Southwest Approaches area and must draw two event cards. We draw another Rough Seas card and a Lone Merchant card. For the Rough Seas card, we will add one stress to U-122 and roll for the enemy aircraft section. We roll a 9 and add it to the evasion factor of 5 found on the U-Boat card, which gives us a total of 14, which results in no stress per the table on the card. We will also get one experience point for this U-Boat. So we add one stress to U-122, and we add one experience point to the campaign log. For the Lone Merchant Event card, we have the option of expending any one torpedo to gain one victory point. Since we are playing a campaign prior to June 1942, we do not have to resolve the enemy contact section. Let's go ahead and exchange a stored torpedo 8 counter with a 7 counter. We can then add one victory point to the campaign log. U-boats can move and draw event cards repeatedly in each operation segment until the U-boat reaches the desired final area. A U-boat can never end its turn in the English Channel. You must finish moving and drawing event cards for one U-boat before moving to another U-boat. You must move all U-boats before moving to the tactical segment. A U-boat must stop when entering a port box. If a U-boat does not move during the operation segment, it must draw a number of event cards as indicated by the patrolling number in the map area. This ends the operations segment. At the start of the tactical segment, we must select one U-boat that is not in a port box or unfit. This will be our active U-boat. 
we will complete the entire tactical segment for one U-boat before moving to the next U-boat. We will elect U-boat 122 in the Southwest Approaches area as our active U-boat and start the contact phase. We must first roll a die with any modifiers and consult the contacts table in the map area. U-boat 122 has a special ability Searcher, which adds one to the contact table die roll. We roll the 10-sided die and receive a 5, which added to 1 gives us a final total of 6. According to the contacts table, this results in two contacts, so we place two contact markers in the map area. This is the number of convoy cards the active U-boat will draw during the tactical segment. We must fully resolve one contact before drawing the next convoy card. The active U-boat is not required to roll in the contacts table. If no contact roll is made, we can move the active U-boat to the searched box in the same map area and then select another active U-boat to continue. We would also move the U-boat into the searched box if our die roll resulted in zero contacts. We can now draw our first convoy card. We draw Convoy Card 37, which is a merchant contact card with four merchants and two escorts. We remove one contact counter for the drawn convoy card. We then add a warning contact counter and the battle location counter to the map area. The battle location counter will remind us where the battle is taking place, since we'll be moving the U-boat counter from the campaign map to the tactical display. If there had been an air search counter in the map area, we would have drawn two convoy cards and selected one of our choice while discarding the other. After we view the convoy card, we can elect to retreat and go straight to the post-combat resolution phase. In this case, we will not retreat and proceed to the next step, which is tactical setup. We will now move to the tactical display. The convoy card shows us where to place ship counters on the tactical display. For escort contacts, we will use the unknown escort counters with the question marks. For merchant contacts, we will use unknown merchant ship counters also indicated by question marks. We then place our attacking U-boat on any of the long-range areas on the tactical display. If the attacking U-boat has the infiltrator special ability, it can be placed in a medium or short-range area. The U-boat can be placed on its surfaced or submerged side. U-boats on the surface move faster and can use gun or torpedo attacks, but are more vulnerable to detection and counterattacks. Submerged U-boats are harder to detect, but cannot use gun attacks and do not move as fast. The third step in the contact phase is to form wolf packs if we so choose. We can try to form a wolf pack by calling for other U-boats in the same map area to join the attack. In this segment, U-boat 122 will attack alone, but if we had wanted U-boat 47 in the same map area to join, we would have rolled the die with any modifiers for each U-boat and consulted the wolf pack notes on the campaign sheet. If successful, we would then have placed the other U-boat counter on any of the long-range areas of the tactical display. U-boats already placed in the searched box cannot be called to join the wolf pack. If the radio call option is purchased, no die roll is necessary, and you can form the wolf pack with other U-boats in the same map area. Our final step in the contact phase is to draw another convoy card to see what special conditions will apply during the combat resolution phase. We draw convoy card 31, which will allow us to add one to our torpedo die rolls. This special condition remains in effect until the end of the combat resolution phase. We now move to the combat resolution phase. The combat resolution steps are repeated until all U-boats have broken off contact, are sunk, or there are no ship counters remaining on the tactical display. If a wolf pack had been formed, each U-boat would act individually. The modifiers for detection, movement, and combat are in the rulebook, but they are also listed on the bottom of the help sheet for easier reference. If you have questions about modifiers during this playthrough, consult the help sheet for a list of the modifiers used. We will be considering modifiers on the help sheet, U-boat cards, and any counters placed on the tactical display. The first step in this phase is to conduct a U-boat movement. A U-boat can move the number of spaces indicated on its counter. It can change between surfaced and submerged before it moves. We will leave the U-boat on the surface so we can travel two spaces. We move the U-boat two spaces into a short range space. A U-boat automatically reveals any unknown ships at a range of zero, one, or two areas. Our U-boat is now within one to two spaces of all of the merchant ships, which we can now identify and replace the unknown counters with the named merchant ship counters. To reveal a merchant ship, we must draw from the merchant deck. We draw one merchant card for each merchant ship, starting in the upper left corner and going clockwise. We draw the following cards and place the appropriate named merchant counters. We can then place the merchant ship cards nearby. The two escorts are still too far away to identify. The next step is the lag movement. 
In the lag movement step, we must select a merchant or naval ship on the tactical display with the highest speed to use as the reference ship for movement. If there are no merchant or naval ships on the tactical display, we use the escort with the highest speed. The reference ship does not move, but all other ships and U-boats that have a lower speed are moved relative to the reference ship. If a ship or U-boat has to move, it moves towards the convoy wake area. For the reference ship during this lag movement, we select the merchant ship Rigel, which has a movement of 2. Since all ships on the tactical display have a speed of 2, we do not move any ships at this time. We then move to the escort detection step. We must perform detection and movement for one escort before moving to the next. We can select escorts in any order. Escorts can detect U-boats on the surface at a range up to 2. Since we are at range 3 for both escorts, they cannot detect us. Since there are no detected U-boats, the die is rolled for each escort. For escort movement results, consult the help sheet to see the applicable table. We roll a 5 for the first escort, so it does not move. For the second escort, we roll an 8, which means it moves one space clockwise in the short range area. The escort is now two spaces from the U-boat, but cannot detect the U-boat since it is no longer the detection phase. The escort is close enough to reveal, so we draw an escort card. The card reveals the identity of the escort as the Ballandary. We can then replace the unknown counter with the Ballandary counter, and we can place the card aside for now. Next is the attack step. In this step, aggressive U-boats get to attack first, but since our only U-boat on the tactical display is cautious, we move to the next step for enemy ships to attack. Enemy ships can now attack the U-boat. The U-boat is not detected, so the escorts cannot attack. However, merchant ships can attack even though the U-boat is not yet detected. The San Fernando and Adamastos can both attack using their surface attack rating on their cards. The San Fernando's attack rating is too light, but since U-122 has an evasion of 5, it can ignore two light hits. The Adamastos has an attack rating of 1 light, so it is also ignored with no resulting damage to the U-boat. Now all cautious U-boats take their turn. Cautious U-boats with the deep dive or silent run encounters cannot attack. The same attack rules apply as described for aggressive U-boats. Submerged and surfaced U-boats can perform torpedo attacks out to a range of three areas. When attacking with torpedoes, we must specify the number of torpedoes fired at each target. We can only fire torpedoes that are in the ready section of the U-boat card. U-122 has six torpedoes ready and 15 stored. Torpedo attacks are resolved after all attacks are declared against the target. We elect to fire a torpedo spread. We gain a bonus to torpedo rolls for firing more than one torpedo at the same target at the same time. The bonus equals the total number of torpedoes fired, minus one. First, we'll attack the San Fernando with four torpedoes. We gain plus three on each torpedo roll due to the torpedo spread. We also gain plus one for our torpedo skill, negative one for range, and plus one for the special condition per the event card we drew previously. Overall, we have a plus four modifier per torpedo shot at the San Fernando. We roll the following, a 1, a 2, a 5, and a 6. We keep the highest die roll, which in this case is the 6, and add 4, giving us a final result of 10. We then refer to the merchant card to determine the result. If the modified die roll is less than the first torpedo number, the torpedo missed the target. If the modified die roll is equal to or greater than the first number, but less than the second number, the target takes light damage. If the modified die roll is equal to or greater than the second number, but less than the third number, the target takes heavy damage. If the roll is equal to or greater than the third number, the target is sunk. Since we rolled a 10, we remove the San Fernando counter from the tactical display, and we reduce our ready torpedoes to 2. We then decide to fire our two remaining torpedoes at the Adamastos, which is at a range of one space away. We gain plus one on each torpedo roll for the torpedo spread, plus one for our torpedo skill, plus one for the convoy card we drew earlier, and negative one for range, giving us a final modifier of plus two for each torpedo die roll. We roll the die twice. We roll a five, and then we roll a three. We keep the highest number, which is five, and add the plus two modifier, totaling seven. We consult the Adam Mastos merchant card and see that a result of seven inflicts heavy damage. We then place a heavy damage counter on the ship. This will provide a negative two modifier for the ship's speed, detection, and attack abilities. It also gives a plus one modifier to U-boats attacking it. Finally, we'll perform a gun attack on the Rigel, which is two spaces away. 
We have a plus one because of our gun skill on the U-boat card, but negative six due to the range. We roll a seven, which is modified to two, resulting in light damage. We apply the light damage counter to the Rigel. This provides a negative one modifier to the ship's speed, detection, and attack abilities. For our U-boat, we remove the two remaining ready torpedoes and reduce our gun ammo counter from six to five. Since there are still active ships and a U-boat on the tactical display, we begin another combat resolution phase. Recall that the combat resolution steps are repeated until all U-boats have broken off contact, are sunk, or there are no ship counters remaining on the tactical display. We place the alerted counter onto the tactical display now that the convoy is aware of the U-boat presence. We elect not to move the U-boat, but choose to dive, so we flip the U-boat counter to the submerged side. The next step is lag movement. The merchant ship Yolata has the fastest speed of 2, so it will be used as the reference ship. The two escorts also have speed 2, so do not move. While submerged, the U-boat speed is 1. We must therefore move it one area closer to the convoy wake. The Adamastos has a reduced speed of 0 due to heavy damage, so it must be moved two spaces towards the convoy wake. The Rigel is at speed 1 due to its damage, so we move it one area closer toward the convoy wake. We next move to Escort Detection and Movement. The Escort Balandary is at range 2 from the U-boat, and the Unknown Escort is at range 4. We choose to have the Unknown Escort act first. It is too far away to detect the U-boat. The Unknown Escort rolls a 9. Consulting the help sheet, we see the Unknown Escort moves one area clockwise. The Escort Balandary would usually be too far away to detect the U-boat, but it gains plus one range due to the alerted counter. Each alerted counter improves both the escort's range and die rolls to detect U-boats by one. It must roll a six to detect the U-boat and gains plus one per the alerted counter. The Balandary rolls a seven and does detect the U-boat. We place a detected counter on the U-boat. Per the help sheet, the escort moves towards the detected U-boat equal to the escort's speed. The escort has a speed of two, so moves two spaces toward the U-boat and ends in the same space as the U-boat. Although the Adamastos is in the same space as the U-boat, the U-boat is submerged, so cannot be attacked by the merchant ship. The escort Balandary can attempt to attack using its submerged attack numbers, but we choose to deep dive to negate the attack. We place a deep dive counter by the U-boat. We then apply two stress to the U-boat card. Our evasion rating is 5, so we must roll a 5 or less to avoid damage. We roll a 6, which is greater than the evasion rating. So we place a flooding temporary damage counter on the U-boat. If the die roll had been a 10, we would have taken one hull lasting damage hit. We cannot attack because of the deep dive counter. This ends the second combat resolution phase, and we remove the deep dive counter. We begin another combat resolution phase. The U-boat now has a movement of one since it is submerged. We move it into the convoy wake area. During this lag movement, we again use the Yulada as the reference ship since it still has a speed of 2. Due to their slower speeds of 1 and 0, the U-boat and the merchant ship Adamastos both move off the tactical display. The escort Balandary does not have to move since its speed of 2 matches that of the reference ship. The U-boat now has broken off contact, so this ends the final combat resolution phase for this U-boat. We then proceed to the post-combat resolution phase. We start this phase after all U-boats are sunk or moved off the tactical display. First, we add one stress to each surviving U-boat that participated in the combat resolution phase. We then ready our torpedoes by taking them from the stored torpedoes area. We then update the campaign log. We sank the merchant ship San Fernando, which earns us three victory points and two experience points for U-boat 122. Even if the U-boat had been destroyed, we would still get credit for any victory points earned by this U-boat. If we had no contacts remaining, we would remove all counters from the tactical display and place the U-boat counter in the searched box of the campaign map area. Since we still have one contact left, we have several options which are listed in the rulebook. We use our remaining contact to select the final shot rule. This means that if one or more ships ended with a heavy damage counter, we can choose to reattack any one of these ships instead of reattacking the whole convoy. First, we remove one contact counter, which in this case is our last one. We can expend any one torpedo or one gun ammo to sink the ship. In this case, we will expend one gun ammo to sink the Adamastos. 
We update the campaign log by adding one experience point and one victory point to U-Boat 122 based on the Adamastos card. U-Boat 122 has no more contacts. We now place the U-Boat in the searched box. We can also remove the battle location counter. The remaining U-Boats must then complete their combat resolution phases. When all U-Boats are in the searched boxes, play moves to the refit segment. In the refit segment, we would first check to see if any of the U-Boats have enough experience points to be promoted to the next experience level. Then we would check to see if we can reduce any stress for the U-Boats. Since all the U-Boats are at sea and there are no supply ships with them, the only U-Boat that can reduce stress is U-Boat 96 because of its cool special ability. At the end of the refit segment, we reset the campaign map by removing the U-Boat warning counters and removing all U-Boats from the searched boxes. We can then start a new turn by going back to the strategic segment. These turns are repeated until all U-Boats return to port twice per the medium campaign requirements or are sunk. Then we would add our victory points on the campaign log to determine our level of success per the table on the campaign sheet. So let's quickly recap victory and loss conditions. When the last U-Boat in play returns to port and reaches its patrol limit or is sunk, the campaign is completed. To see how you did, add up the victory points in your campaign log. Remember to deduct two victory points for each turn when there were no U-Boats at sea, and deduct three victory points for each U-Boat sunk. Then refer to the appropriate victory point table on the campaign sheet to see how you did. You can also play all four campaigns in chronological order. The length you choose for the first campaign will be the same one you will use for all four campaigns. The rulebook explains how special option points and experience are carried over from one campaign to the next. This concludes this review of U-Boat Leader 2nd Edition. Visit us at these sites and don't forget to leave a comment about your experience with this game, or let us know what game you would like to see reviewed next. And if you'd like to experience something greater than plumbing the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, stick around for our disclaimer. Coming up next...